For as long as people have been able to think, we've been trying to understand ourselves and others. The goal of understanding human mental processes and behavior actually originated in philosophy. In fact, ancient scholars asked some of the same important questions about humans that psychologists examine today. However, in the 19th century, scientists began to systematically investigate psychological processes. Since then, we have made incredible progress in understanding how people think and behave. In ancient Greece, early philosophers such as Aristotle and Plato debated psychological issues. Was how a person thought and acted inborn? Like, did mental activity and behavior result from a person's biological nature? Or were mental activity and behavior acquired through education, experience, and culture? For example, did they result from how a person was nurtured? Psychologists have carried on this nature-nurture debate for as long as psychology has been a field of study. Psychologists now recognize that both nature and nurture influence psychological traits. And throughout this course, you'll see many examples of how nature and nurture influence each other so much that they are hard to separate. Another classic question in psychology is the mind-body problem. Are the mind and body separate and distinct, or is the mind simply a person's personal experience of the physical brain's activity? The ancient Greeks and Romans knew that the brain was essential for normal mental functioning. Their understanding came largely from their observations of people who had suffered blows to the head and then lost consciousness, or people who had experienced changes in certain mental abilities, or both. By contrast, at other points in history, scholars believed that the mind was separate from and in control of the body. This claim was partly based on the strong religious belief that humans have a divine and immortal soul. In this view, the soul is separate from the physical body and departs from the body upon death. In the 1600s, the French philosopher René Descartes suggested the idea of dualism, that the mind and body are separate yet intertwined. The body, Descartes argued, was nothing more than an organic machine governed by reflex. And in keeping with prevailing religious beliefs, he concluded that the rational mind was divine and separate from the physical body. Today, psychologists reject dualism. The current view among psychologists is that the mind emerges from biological activity in the brain. Historically, philosophers used thinking to answer the big questions about who we are. However, in the mid-1800s in Europe, psychology arose as a scientific field of study and then spread throughout the world. During this time, different ways of thinking about psychology emerged. After a school of thought emerged, it would dominate for a while. When the flaws of that approach became apparent, a new school of thought would emerge. So we're going to look now at several schools of thought that have laid the foundation for the modern science of psychology. Experimental psychology began in 1879 when Wilhelm Wundt established the first psychological laboratory. Wundt based his investigations on a realization. Psychological processes are the products of brain activity, so they must take time to occur. The time it takes to complete a psychological task is called reaction time. Wundt assumed that more complex psychological tasks would require more brain activity and so would take longer than simple tasks. To this day, researchers use reaction time to study psychological processes, although their equipment is far more modern. Wundt was not satisfied with studying mental reaction times. He developed a new method to measure people's conscious exper experiences. This method was called introspection. Using introspection, research participants had to reflect and report on their thoughts about their personal experiences of objects. For example, participants would experience a series of objects and say, say which one of them they found the most pleasant. Wundt's work investigating conscious experiences was critical to the development of psychology. He trained many of the great early psychologists who went on to establish psychological laboratories throughout Europe, Canada, and the United States. One of Wundt's students was Edward Titchener. Titchener pioneered a school of thought that became known as structuralism. This school is based on the idea that conscious experience can be broken down into underlying parts. Titchener believed that if psychologists could understand the basic elements of conscious experiment, experience, they would have a scientific basis for understanding the mind. Suppose research participants were played a musical tone or showed an object such as an apple. Through introspection, the participants would analyze their personal experiences of the stimulus. In this way, the researcher would identify the component parts of each participant's experience, such as the quality and intensity of the stimulus. Although Wundt ultimately rejected the use of introspection, Titchener relied on the method throughout his career. The general problem with introspection is that it's unique to each person who's having the experience. 
In other words, each person brings to introspection a unique way of perceiving things. Research, researchers cannot determine whether participants in a study are using introspection in a similar way. Over time, psychologists largely abandoned introspection because it was not a reliable method for understanding psychological process, processes across different people. Even so, Wundt, Titchener, and other structuralists were important because they helped develop a science of psychology with its own vocabulary and set of rules. Titchener was also important to the history of psychology because his first graduate student was female. Margaret Floyd Washburn was the first woman to officially be granted a PhD in psychology in 1894 from Cornell University. Her work in understanding animal behavior led to the influential book, The Animal Mind, a textbook of comparative psychology. In 1921, Washburn was elected the second female president of the American Psychological Association, also known as the APA. One critic of structuralism was William James. James believed that structuralism failed to capture the most important aspects of mental experience. He argued that the mind was much more complex than its elements and could not be broken down into parts. Psychologists who used the structural approach, he said, were like people trying to understand a house by studying each of its bricks individually. More important to James was that the bricks together formed a house and that a house has a particular function. In short, the most important function of the mind is in how it's useful to people. This approach came to be known as functionalism. According to functionalism, what is the purpose of the human mind? James felt that the answer to that was to help preserve human life over time by helping people adapt to environmental demands. This key idea of functionalism was based on the work of the naturalist Charles Darwin, who observed that species change over generations. When these changes helped individuals of a species adapt to an environment, the individuals were more likely to survive and reproduce, and therefore to pass along those changes to their offspring. This process is called natural selection, and it's the basis of evolution. Included among the traits that are passed from parent to offspring is the functioning of the brain and mind. So natural selection explains how the human mind has evolved to help people adapt to their environments and bear children who are also more likely to survive. James was not just a pioneer in developing functionalist school of psychology. He also broke ground by admitting a woman, Mary Witten Calkins, to study in his graduate seminar at Harvard University in 1890. The rest of the students, all male, dropped out of the class in response, so James tutored Calkins individually. Although she completed the requirements to earn her PhD, Harvard refused to give her the degree because she was female. Regardless, Calkins continued her research on memory and became one of the most prominent psychologists of her time. In 1905, she was elected the first female president of the APA. 20th century psychology was profoundly influenced by one of its most famous thinkers, Sigmund Freud. Freud was trained in medicine. At the beginning of his career, he worked with people who had nervous system disorders, such as paralysis of various body parts. He found that many of his patients had few medical reasons for their paralysis. Soon he came to believe that psychological factors were causing their conditions. To try to understand the connections between psychology and physical problems, Freud developed the psychoanalytic theory. Freud concluded that much of human behavior is determined by mental processes operating below the level of conscious awareness. He believed that these specific unconscious mental forces included both troubling childhood experiences blocked from memory and sexual urges that conflicted with acceptable behavior. By creating psychological blockages within the individual, these forces produce psychological discomfort and even mental disorders. From his theories, Freud developed the practice of psychoanalysis. In this therapeutic approach, the therapist and the patient work together to bring the contents of the patient's unconscious into the person's conscious awareness. Once the patient's unconscious conflicts are revealed, the therapist helps the patient deal with them constructively. One of Freud's most famous patients was his daughter, Anna Freud. Her experience with the process of psychoanalysis and in hearing her father's conversations with influential thinkers of the time had a more profound effect on her than her formal training as a teacher. In her most famous book, The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defense, Freud detailed her psychoanalytic theory. Both Sigmund Freud and Anna Freud heavily influenced the public view of psychology. However, many of their ideas are difficult or impossible to test scientifically. In the early 20th century, psychological researchers shifted away from studying the conscious and unconscious experiences of the mind. Some researchers, such as the Gestalt 
psychologists believe that mental experience cannot be broken down into common underlying parts. Other researchers, such as behaviorists, believe that the conscious mind and the unconscious mind were not appropriate topics for psychological investigation. The ideas of Gestalt psychology, behaviorism, and subsequent schools of thought are the historical basis for modern psychological research on mental activity. Gestalt psychology developed in opposition to structuralism. This new school of thought sought to understand how people perceive information, and the most promised to Prominent Gestalt psychologists included Max Wertheimer and Wolfgang Kohler. Around 1912, the Gestalt psychologists began to explore how people experience sensory input. For example, why can two people view an object in very different ways? How can one person look at an object more than once and see it differently each time? Research into questions such as these led to the development of Gestalt theory. According to this set of ideas, the perception of objects is a personal experience. In other words, in direct contrast with structuralism, what a person experiences is different from all the parts of an object. The Gestalt perspective has influenced many areas of psychology, including the study of vision and our understanding of human personality. In 1913, the psychologist John B. Watson challenged the focus on conscious and unconscious mental processes as being unscientific. He felt that if psychology were going to be a science, it had to stop trying to study mental events that could not be observed directly. Instead, Watson believed that animals, including humans, learned all behaviors through environmental factors. Specifically, Watson believed that psychologists needed to study the environmental stimuli, the behavioral triggers, in particular situations. By understanding the stimuli, people could predict the animal's behavior responses to those situations. Watson developed the School of Behaviorism, which investigates how observable stimuli in the environment affect behavior. Watson's views have been furthered by thousands of psychologists, including B.F. Skinner. Behaviorism dominated psychological research well into the 1960s. Behaviorists established many principles that are still viewed as critical to understanding behavior. For example, the use of rewards to teach children to clean their rooms is based on behaviorist principles. However, even researchers in the school of behaviorism, such as Edward Tolman, doubted that all psychological processes could be reduced to stimulus-response relationships. Tolman's research with rats was among the first to reveal that animals have internal states that create a sense of purpose in their behavior. And this work was among the first to indicate that psychology should not just focus on how stimuli affect behavior. Rather, psychology must also investigate internal mental processes, including feelings and thoughts. In the 1950s, most schools of thought viewed behavior as resulting from events outside of people's control. Freudians saw unconscious forces as guiding behavior, whereas behaviors saw environmental factors as guiding behavior. Rejecting these views, psychologists such as Abraham Maslow and Carl Rogers focused on how people are free to choose activities that make them feel happy and bring them fulfillment. This more positive perspective toward personal growth became known as humanistic psychology. This approach emphasized the basic goodness of people. It focused on how people should accept themselves, work on personal goals, and try to live up to their full potential as human beings. For example, humanistic psychologists might investigate why you're more motivated to work hard to complete your education and how happy you feel when you achieve your goal. Building on these earlier ideas, Martin Seligman launched the positive psychology movement. Seligman and others have encouraged the scientific study of how faith, values, creativity, courage, and hope affect us. Positive psychology emphasizes the quality of relationships and taking enjoyment from life's accomplishments. In the second half of the 20th century, researchers continued to gather evidence that learning was not as simple as the behaviorists believed. These findings suggested that mental functions were important for understanding behavior. In 1957, George A. Miller and his colleagues, including Ulrich Neiser, launched the cognitive revolution in behavior, in cognitive revolution in psychology. Today, cognitive psychology is concerned with investigating mental functions such as intelligence, thinking, language, attention, learning, memory, problem solving, and decision making. While some early cognitive psychologists focused exclusively on mental processes, others recognized that the brain was important to cognition. In the early 1980s, cognitive psychologists joined forces with computer sciences, scientists, philosophers, and researchers who studied the brain. The goal of this collaboration was to develop an integrated view of mind and brain. 
During the next decade, cognitive neuroscience emerged. And the field of cognitive neuroscience studies the brain mechanisms that underlie thought, learning, and memory. By now, you should understand how modern psychologists have come to focus on understanding mental activity, behavior, and the brain. And as you'll soon learn, this past work has laid the foundation for the development of many subfields in psychology. Each subfield investigates specific topics by using specific methods. Throughout the history of psychology, the various schools of thought helped shape how psychologists viewed mental activity and behavior. Today, the schools are less important. Instead, psychologists understand that phenomena need to be examined from many different perspectives. Today, there's a wide range of interests that modern psychologists have across the main subfields of the discipline. In many of these subfields, psychologists conduct research to help us understand the mind, behavior, and the brain process under, processes underlying them. For example, a health psychologist might explore how having a pet influences heart rate and blood pressure to have positive health effects. Or a social psychologist could explore how participating in sports helps teenagers develop leadership skills. Yet other psychologists study culture. A culture is made up of beliefs, values, rules, norms, and customs that people learn from one another when they share a common language or environment. And a cultural psychologist might study why different cultures prefer different types of music. In other subfields, psychologists focus on providing services to individuals and groups. For example, clinical psychologists help people with mental health problems cope with challenges and crises in personal, professional, and academic domains. Yet in other subfields, such as educational psychology, professionals work in schools. For example, they help students with problems that interfere with learning, design age-appropriate curriculum, and conduct aptitude achievement tests. Because psychologists today work in various subfields, they also work in diverse settings. Where they work depends on whether their primary focus is on research, teaching, clinical practice with patients, or applying scientific findings to improve the quality of daily living. Researchers who study the brain, the mind, and behavior may work in schools, businesses, universities, or clinics. Some practitioners apply the findings of psychological research to help people in need of mental health treatment, designing safe and pleasant work environments, counseling people on career paths, or helping teachers design better educational experiences. The distinction between psychological research and clinical psychology can be fuzzy. Many researchers are also clinical practitioners, and many clinical psychologists study psychological disorders as well as treat them. As you can see, psychology is remarkably diverse in its subfields of study and in the places where psychologists work. And that's because psychologists are concerned with nearly every aspect of human life, regardless of where they work and what they do. Psychologists are scientists. And in seeking to understand the brain, the mind, and behavior, psychologists use the scientific method. 